Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker and today we're going to be talking about ostracism, specifically the psychological effects of ostracism and how these can be managed. Here to help me better understand this complex issue is Andrew Hales, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Virginia. Andrew's research involves the psychology of social ostracism, including the perspectives of both the shunned and those doing the shunning. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome him to the channel. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm absolutely thrilled that you could join me. It's a subject I've been meaning to do a video on for some time now. And part of the problem has been finding someone who um, is willing to devote their time and energies to studying this field. So I guess one uh, obvious question to kick off with would be what prompted you to take an interest in this field of study? Yeah, well, um, and we can start a little more generally with social psychology it, itself. Um, I'm very interested in how people influence each other. Um, Early in college, I, I read the book um, Influence uh, by Robert Cialdini, and that sort of um, sparked a fascination with how people can, um, well, influence each other. Um, what's kind of interesting, though, is that at the heart of all of this is it, sort of an ultimate concern with how we are regarded by other people. So some of the most interesting and classic social psychology findings um, document how uh, prone we are to conform to absurd norms or, you know, go along with things that we know aren't true. And, um, and it was sort of um, assumed along the way with a lot of these studies that people would do that because they were ultimately scared of being left out. Um, what's really interesting is that in the last few decades, uh, some research has started to systematically look at that rather than just assume it's the case that people hurt when they're left out, we've started doing studies actually uh, measuring the effects of being left out. And, uh, and that's just been really fascinating. So um, my interest is, is pretty academic on, on this point. Um, sometimes people ask if maybe you have an interest in this because you were left out as a child. Joke, joke, you know. But uh, no, that's sort of uh, where I'm coming from. Mm. And yeah, it's interesting that really when you think about it, some form of shunning um, is just part of the human experience, even from when we're young. I mean, go to your room um, is basically, in a, in a way, using ostracism to, again, influence. Um, parents would argue, and you know, I've done it myself with my child, you're, you're giving them, you're trying to influence them in a positive way rather than kind of weaponizing um, social interaction or lack thereof uh, against the child, but it, it is something that is has far more permutations than purely the religious side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Um, one of the most interesting findings to come out of um, this this research in the last few decades um, is is you know I, I think most people won't be surprised to learn that ostracism hurts. It, mm undeniably painful to be shunned from, from a group. Um, what researchers were uh, surprised to discover is how minor the ostracism needs to be to cause these effects. So even just the most subtle cues that you're being left out can trigger um, some pretty strong responses. So usually when we talk about ostracism, we think of um, complete shunning, um, maybe lasting weeks, months, or years. Um, we think of an entire community excluding somebody. And those are possibly the most interesting forms of ostracism. And ultimately, I think that's why it's worth studying. But what's really fascinating is that um, smaller experiences, things like um, somebody um, not answering your question, pretending not to hear you, denying eye contact, or even, even giving short one-word answers when normally you'd expect a, a conversation to occur, those, those can also sting. Um, and, and so it's, uh, mm. 
interesting from that perspective. It's almost beyond your control. Uh, it, it shouldn't in some cases sting, especially if it's from a virtual stranger. But it's almost as though something primal takes over. <laughs> And you feel you feel you feel wounded by it. So that's fascinating. Um, how you mentioned before about how you've been able to do research studies to actually kind of quantify ostracism. So how is it possible to experimentally study this subject? Yeah, so there are a number of methods at our disposal here. Um, I should mention that I'm a, a social psychologist, and in general, we tend to prefer uh, experimental methods where people are randomly assigned to have uh, one experience versus another, and that allows us to make really strong causal conclusions. Um, so when I'm doing experiments, um, I'll often use a procedure called cyberball, uh, this was developed in the year 2000 by um, Kipling Williams. He originated uh, much of the interest uh, in the last few decades in ostracism. He got the ball rolling on all this research. And, um, and so in Cyberball, um, participants are told that they're going to play a brief online ball tossing game with a few other people who are connected through the network. And the ostensible purpose for the game is to practice your mental visualization skills. So people are told it doesn't really matter who gets the ball or not. The point of this is just to have an opportunity to practice picturing scenes in your mind. Um, and during the game, people are typically randomly assigned to an inclusion condition um, where the other players who are in fact controlled by uh, a pre-programmed uh, computer that treats them a certain way. Um, they'll either include you fairly or in a typical ostracism condition, they'll throw you the ball a few times early on. You can see that the game is working as it's supposed to, but then after that, they will um, ostracize you from the game. They'll throw the ball to each other and, um, and it usually lasts just two or three minutes. These are strangers you've never met before. You have no expectation of meeting them in the future. Logically, it shouldn't affect people. But when we give standardized questionnaires afterwards, assessing uh, people's well-being and um, levels of what we call four basic psychological needs, we find surprisingly uh, reliable and large strong effects on people's feelings that they belong, their feelings of self-esteem, their feelings that they have control, and their feelings that their existence matters. Sure. And uh, am I right in saying that this cyberball that, you, you, that you're describing, which sounds fascinating, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Dr. Kipling Williams um, produced this or um, originated this exercise. Is it, am I right in saying that this, this kind of idea came to him after he um, was strolling through a park and found himself in a game of Frisbee with total strangers who initially were throwing him the frisbee but all of a sudden inexplicably stopped and he yeah. felt kind of tangible anger and thought this would be a great way of measuring ostracism would that be right yeah that that, that would be right um as i understand it he was interested in in studying ostracism ostracism prior to that but um didn't have quite the right experimental um approach to doing it and so that that seemed to be the aha moment that got it you can imagine it's a bit of a challenge because you need something that's um, ethical to perform on humans, something that gives a small dose of what the experience is like without, of course, devastating people. It's important that everyone leaves feeling okay. Sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I think perfectly, again, describes how in some cases it doesn't make sense especially if it is virtual strangers who, as you mentioned, you have no anticipation of having any bonds with in the future. But it's almost like we're, we're programmed to have these reactions. It's bizarre. Um, so that being the case, what has been learned about the effects of ostracism on the one who is being ostracized? Mm -hmm. um, quite a bit. So it helps to structure this around a, a theory. So we can sort of organize the findings that have accumulated over the years. 
Um, so the model I work from is the one developed by uh, Kip Williams, which is the temporal need threat model of ostracism. So um, according to the model, ostracism can be examined in three stages that occur in sequence. So first, you have to notice that you're being ostracized. What's surprising here is that people are highly, highly sensitive. In fact, probably even oversensitive to signs that they might be excluded. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, this makes some sense. Um, for survival reasons, it's important to be a part of a group. And if you are being ostracized, it's really important to notice that. So um, the common analogy here is a, a, fire, attack, uh, a fire detector in, in a home. You would want a fire detector that is um, biased towards false positives. You want it to be oversensitive because the cost of not detecting a fire that's really there is life-threatening, but the cost of waking you up in the middle of the night is, is annoying, but, uh, but relatively speaking, pretty minor. So um, with ostracism, the cost of not knowing that you've been left out of a group and not being able to course correct mm -hmm. is um, social death, which could in fact lead to actual de death um, as humans were evolving. So the idea there is that you notice you're being ostracized and you can correct your behavior um, uh, or seek new affiliations with a different group, for example. Um, so in any event, people notice that they're being ostracized rather quickly and they experience pain. Um, pain is not hyperbolic. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that people literally experience pain when they're being left out. Uh, brain scanning studies have been done using cyberball and they've found uh, meaningful overlap between the parts of the brain that register physical pain and the parts of the brain that register the social or emotional pain of being left out. So rather than it simply being a questionnaire-based experiment, you were actually measuring brain activity while people were playing the cyberball? Yeah, so that yeah. was um, uh, from an earlier paper in the early 2000s, and, and they did, in fact, um, measure brain activation during cyberball. Fascinating. So it, it's, like you say, it's not hyperbolic, it's actual pain. Um, behaviorally, how does how does ostracism or the effects of ostracism, how do they manifest? Yeah, so that's where things get a little more complicated. Um, so it's certainly painful to be ostracized. Um, we know that it threatens those four basic needs that I mentioned. You, you, know, you, you feel like an outsider. It's a little different than just having a conversation where someone might call you a mean name because you can always yell back at them and then they'll, they'll yell back at you and you're participating in your social environment. But with ostracism, you get to see the world carry on without you as if you aren't there. And it, it could be this surreal experience of uh, life without you. And, um, and so ostracism is unique in that it threatens all four of those needs rather than just one or two. So behaviorally, there are a few ways to, um, to respond to it. And uh, the, the research here is um, uh, a bit of a mess. So um, people can respond, let's say, crudely three different categories here. And predicting when someone might take one course versus another is a rather complicated thing to do. And, and so maybe we can come back to that. But in general, people can respond pro-socially. I mentioned that the pain of ostracism is thought to be functional. It helps alert people that their behavior might need to, to change to get back into the group. Um, so studies have shown, uh, for example, that after people have been ostracized, they're very sensitively tuned to social information, like um, uh, detecting real versus fake smiles, for example. Um, they're also more likely to uh, conform to a group norm after they've been ostracized, um, more likely to um, obey uh, um, an authority figure, things like that. So behaviors that are generally pro-social and going along to get along. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's more important to be noticed than to be liked. So studies also find uh, fairly reliably that ostracism provokes aggression. Um, 
So people lash out if necessary to, uh, to be acknowledged. Um, and finally, ostracism can cause uh, withdrawal, um, where you uh, limit the risk of future ostracism by somewhat ironically seeking solitude for a time to sort of lick your wounds before uh, re-entering the social world. Anecdotally, um, obviously, coming at this from the perspective of religious shunning, um, anecdotally, there's a lot of evidence in the, at least in the ex-Jehovah's Witness uh, movement, that um, shunning can lead people to commit suicide or at least attempt suicide. Um, would would that come as a surprise to you, or is that kind of what you would expect? Um. I'm not surprised by that. Um, the research on the long-term effects of, of ostracism is, um, uh, there's less of it because of practical, ethical, logistical constraints. But what research does exist on this um, suggests that that would be the case. So um, for example, some early studies did qualitative interviews with people who had been ostracized for um, long periods of time by close family members, and um, and there were signs of depression and associated issues there in those qualitative, rich, detailed interviews. Um, more recently, um, the, the psychologist Paulo Riva has done some really great work looking at, um, I mentioned there's these stages to ostracism. The third stage is called this the resignation stage, where people, um, if they're unable to satisfy those basic needs that I mentioned, then uh, it's predicted that they would succumb to depression, alienation, feelings of um, helplessness. And um, sure enough, when you measure those things correlationally, we, we can't do experiments here for obvious reasons, but uh, at least when you measure the correlations, there are uh, strong and troubling relationships between chronic ostracism and um, signs of mental health problems. Yeah, that, that, that kind of chimes with, again, the experiences that you, you hear of, um, not just in the ex-Jehovah's Witness movement, but I would suggest more broadly within kind of fundamentalist groups. Um, moving to the other side of the issue, you have, well, we're talking here about people who are being shunned your research, I, I believe, includes those who are doing the shunning or those who are ostracizing others. So what psychological or behavioral impact does ostracism have on those doing the ostracizing? Mm -hmm. um, so this is another area that's uh, sort of complicated to study for, um, for purely logistical reasons. The, the complication here is that in real life, normally when someone ostracizes somebody, they do it for good reason, and they most likely feel justified in doing it. So when we look at laboratory studies where people are randomly assigned, um, sometimes an experimenter might um, contrive a reason for asking you to ostracize somebody else, for example, people report not liking it at all. It's not particularly fun to ostracize someone for, for no reason. I think it's fair to extrapolate from that, that when people are using ostracism, they're not intrinsically enjoying it, but they're doing it most likely for uh, what they view as a, a higher ultimate purpose or, or reason. And um, in their mind, it's most likely moralistic and justified, um, if not particularly fun to administer. Um, some earlier research on this showed that sometimes administ administering ostracism being the source of it um, is associated with higher feelings of control, which sort of makes sense if, you know, there's something very empowering about um, being able to decide when somebody is allowed to have attention or not. Sure. And I just can't help but think that in, in a way, especially when it comes to religious ostracism, um, in a way it's kind of worse if, if you're the one that's doing the shunning and it's not for a good reason. Um, so it's ju you're, you're just doing the shunning because you're told to do the shunning because that's what you're supposed to do. 
even if say you know that deep down that the one that you're shunning is basically a good person and you're you're basically just following orders um i think that what happens then is you kind of take a hit with your humanity and and you have to live with the fact that you you're just again following orders rather than um being ethical whereas the one who's being shunned under those circumstances gets to kind of in a way keep the moral high ground and even though it's painful they at least know that it's it's out of their control um so in in a way the ostracism although you, you mention it as being like a a manifestation of control sometimes it, the control comes from somewhere else if that makes sense yeah um that's interesting i i think i think especially in a religious context i can see how that dynamic would play out um what fascinates me especially about that is the possibility of um, what social psychologists would call a pluralistic ignorance, uh, mm -hmm. where each member of a group makes assumptions about what every other member is thinking. I could imagine a scenario in which um, I'm ostracizing this person because I was told to, even though I don't think it's right, but this whole group thinks it's right. But if we were to interview every member of the group, we might discover that they're thinking the exact same thing that I am, which is just passively assuming that, that I want to be ostracizing, even though I, I'd rather not. Um, so I, I think sort of the top-down structure uh, of some forms of religious ostracism um, is, is really unique and interesting and differentiates it from um, more of what we might call the silent treatment of ostracism between two individuals. Indeed, yeah, I can, and which is why I'm glad that you're studying it because, there's, as far as I can tell, there's studies of ostracism, but not necessarily always studies of um, religious ostracism. Which, you know, just in the way I've explained, where you know someone's shunning because they're following orders as opposed to doing it because they think it's the right thing to do the dynamic kind of subtly changes there. So I'm glad that it's being um, studied. Um, do reactions to ostracism differ from, we mentioned before, say a virtual stranger shunning you versus a close family member? Mm -hmm. um, almost certainly. Um, so I am not aware of any studies that have directly compared apples to apples, but uh, the whole spirit of the experimental cyberball type approach that we take is to create the most minimalistic forms of ostracism. See if those have an effect. And if even that hurts, then I, I think it's a fair assumption that ostracism for long periods of time between family members who know each other uh, is almost certainly more hurtful. Now, there have also been correlational studies looking at ostracism within families and those patterns of cor correlations corroborate that so um, family ostracism has been studied um, Joan Paulson is a psychologist who's done some great research here um, one interesting um, indication that came out of that research I'm uh, curious if you have any thoughts on is that um, apparently often um, it takes a big event to terminate the ostracism so, you know, without some life altering um, big occurrence to reunite people, it could go on indefinitely. Mm. And that fits with the earlier qualitative research showing that, you know, sometimes people report at least that they get caught in a web where after you've ostracized for so long, it's so hard to, to admit you were wrong and, and reconnect with someone. Yeah, I think there's definitely. Um, how can how can I put this? Um, when when you're shunning for a long period of time, you're kind of in in a way invested in it, so that if you were to kind of suddenly do a U-turn, you'd then have to account for all of the years, perhaps when you were shunning that person. Uh, it, it's probably easier in some ways to just continue um, as you were, um, but I also think that. The, again, the, the control element of ostracism isn't to be um, underestimated because you mentioned that it can require a big jolt, as it were, like a life-changing event 
to end the ostracism? And what more life changing can you get than finding out that the religion that you've been devoting your life to actually is, is wrong or in some way abusive or unworthy of your loyalty and devotion so that you're turning around to the control, the controller who's ordering you to shun your, your loved one. And you're saying, I'm no longer following your orders. Um, that is a massive deal when, again, you've invested so much of your life, potentially years or even decades to, uh, you've invested it in this religion. And then all of a sudden you, you know, the, the scales fall and you realize, you know, you, you're, you're brought into reality in a very jarring way. So yeah, I can imagine it being a, a big deal to, to do a U-turn. Yeah, certainly. Um, what can victims of ostracism do to try to mitigate the psychological impact? Mm -hmm. So um, I've done some research on this. Um, most of it looking, again, we've got these stages. Um, and my research has sort of looked at the, the periods following the initial reflexive pain of ostracism. Um, the, the first factor that seems to help is um, simple distraction. Um, when, when we're dealing with short-term one-off instances of virtual ostracism, ruminating about it seems to make things worse. So um, even things like when we compare um, a control condition of participants who play cyberball and then we just let them think about what they would naturally think about, turns out that they'll usually ruminate over the experience. And if we compare them just to another group of people who say, write about what you had for lunch, um, nothing particularly pleasant, but something other than the pain of ostracism, those people will recover more. Um, a few other responses I've identified that, that help are um, uh, self-affirmation, um, where you sort of reflect on other areas of your life that, um, that are meaningful and positive to you. Um, and uh, so that seems to help, as does... Um, with religious participants uh, saying a prayer. So we, we randomly assign people to pray, especially for those who are uh, more religious, that helps people recover from ostracism. The way I like to think of that is that um, religion, recall that there's those four basic needs threatened by ostracism. There's belonging, self-esteem, control, and meaningful existence. Religion, at least many, are almost perfectly suited to, to address all four of those needs. So religions tend to have communities and they um, tend to involve or uh, have theological beliefs that involve a, a benevolent God that looks positively on you. And, and, um, and of course, meaningful existence is, is the easiest one. What's more meaningful than religion? So, um, so I, I think religion um, can help people recover from ostracism, but it's interesting because we can also think of it as the cause of so much ostracism. So it, it, it's certainly a complicated dynamic. I can definitely relate to uh, distraction um, because, you know, when you're occupied with something, and especially if it's something that, you know, requires a lot of creative energy, perhaps, and requires a lot of concentration. Um, you are less inclined to, as you say, ruminate over perhaps more the more unpleasant dynamics going on in your family. And I, I think, in my own case, being involved as an activist um, has helped in, in you know distracting from the fact that I'm being shunned by my father, for example. Um, and I, I think time is a healer to some extent as well, because inevitably you form other social bonds. I mean, you mentioned before that one of the reasons why um, ostracism is kind of hardwired into us is because it's kind of an alert mechanism. You need to go find some other social group or you're going to die on the savannah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think just kind of time and distraction. I can definitely relate to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm curious what you would think about um, 
I, I think there's an interesting open question for future research. Um, and as far as I'm aware, no one, no one's directly ta tackled this question yet. But um, if prior experiences with ostracism will buffer you or sensitize you to future ostracism experiences, I think there's good reasons to hypothesize either. Um, I'd be interested in studying that. What do you think? There's a little bit of that that goes on, yeah. Um, so sometimes, for example, you'll have ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who are being shunned by believing family members because they've left the group. And then they will inevitably seek to engage with other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And of course, on social media, it's it's a bit of a mess, whatever, when it comes to kind of managing your experience and and making sure you're kind of being responsible with how much information you share with what are essentially total strangers. But what, what I found is that if you find yourself having to, let's say, unfriend someone who you friended just because they're an ex-Jehovah's Witness, only to find out that they're actually not the sort of person you want to be sharing pictures of your children with, they might then react by saying, oh, um, he's just as bad as the governing body because he's shunning me. I've been disfellowshipped. Well, and that's yeah. clearly not what's happened. You know, we never knew each other to begin with. And on, on a personal level, we all get to decide who our friends are. Yeah. Um, you can't kind of equate that to a religion kind of mandating that anyone who doesn't agree with the leaders should be severed from their families. It's two completely different issues. But they do, people do tend to kind of, I've noticed, resort to that particular accusation, uh, probably, again, because they've been sensitized over the the actual religiously mandated shunning that they've been subjected to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that, does, uh, that does make sense. And uh, just one um, last question, and pro perhaps this is the most profound question. Um, we've mentioned that studies of religiously mandated shunning um there, there could be more research i think it's safe to say and for example when i brought up um the the incidents of suicide it's safe to say that there could there's the scope perhaps for more research to be done on that especially if it's killing people um so do you think society needs to be more mindful um, and perhaps devote more resources to the mental health issues surrounding ostracism? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that needs to be a priority for exactly the reasons um, you mentioned. Um, I think there are a lot of parties that need to play a different role in that process. So um, I, I know um, from a researcher's perspective, Sometimes it's um, easier to do lab studies than uh, real world studies um, in places, especially where there are um, high stakes consequences. Um, both of those are important. Basic research helps for theory building and development, but that only gets you so far. Um, so studies getting out into the real world, looking at these processes are really important. Um, I think governments should fund that research. Uh, of course, that's um, uh, that, that's important. The, the one uh, um, area where I, I might be a little more hesitant is um, I, ostracism is complicated. Um, uh, from what little I know about the Jehovah's Witness Church practice of ostracism is it's fairly unique. Um, and I think its uniqueness is, is why maybe that particular version of ostracism should be, um, should be studied. But more generally, I, I hesitate to tell people not to use ostracism because I think it's functional um, in, many, in many cases. In, in our day-to-day -day lives, for example, um, I, I've done some research on the trait of disagreeableness. Um, interpersonally, person to person, we're more likely to ostracize others who are disagreeable. And that tends to help protect us from interaction partners who might take advantage. And I think that's okay. And that strikes me as maybe kind of similar to you selecting your friends on, on Facebook. Like that's, um, 
a version or a dose of ostracism that that I'm comfortable with. Um, so so setting that aside, absolutely looking at um, long term chronic ostracism, especially in an organized concerted fashion. Um, there needs to be more research on that um, for sure. Sure. And I'm stretching you now. <laughs> so feel free to kind of say that this is way too taking it too far. But uh, I'm interested in, um, in ways of finding solutions to the more abusive elements of, of religion. I, I'd li- I like to think that even if things aren't perfect now, that future generations will figure out ways of curbing um, abuse that's done in the name of religion. And when it comes to ostracism, um, it seems to me, again, mostly anecdotally, that we have um, something that is weaponized as a means of control to stop people from uh, disagreeing with the leaders and to make sure those who do disagree with the leaders are punished by being ejected. And uh, the Jehovah's Witness publications make no attempts to disguise the fact that the, that this is basically emotional blackmail, that they expect those who are being shunned to want to um, repair their relationships with their families by returning to the religion, regardless necessarily of whether they agree with it or not. So I'm interested in knowing what can be done to stop religions from utilizing ostracism in quite such a malicious way. Do, can you foresee a time when religions that do weaponize ostracism are penalized in some way, perhaps by, for example, losing um, tax, um, tax exemption. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. Um, I'm stretching you, I told you at the beginning, but I'm, I'm just interested. Yeah, I, I mean, Tax exemption is, that seems to be one area where public opinion might be able to get a, a toehold on, on what private religions are, are able to do. Um, before that comes into play, I think conversations like this, I hope, will, will help with that. Simply raising consciousness uh, about um, how serious and consequential ostracism can be. Um, more research is, is certainly necessary here, as you mentioned. Of course, as a scientist, I have to be open to the possibility that the research might come back and suggest that m- maybe ostracism plays less of a role in suicides and depression than we thought. I would be surprised by that, but that could turn out to be the case. Um, but n- nevertheless, talking about it, um, uh, telling people th- uh, that it is a serious, painful experience, um, is, is a good way to raise consciousness. So the, it, it seems like the, the dilemma is that the, the church leadership seems to have a pretty tight hold on its members within the church and, uh, and reaching those members may be, may be difficult. I'm optimistic that the internet will help. Um, I, a, a big part of how I ended up leaving the, the church, I was raised in the Mormon church when I became about 19, I started reading a lot on the internet and that just made it impossible to keep believing. So I, I'm optimistic that, that that'll happen. I, I do think if we're talking about religion generally, I, I'm aware that there's plenty of research showing that there are psychological benefits to religion. That doesn't make them true but it does make them perhaps important for people. So I, I try to be mindful that religion um, needs to be replaced with something, some source of meaning or purpose in, in people's lives. And, and that's not an easy thing to do, but, um, but I think that's part of the, the challenge that, that people face. So that's sort of a lot, but that's, those are some thoughts. Sure, yeah. Well, you mentioned resignation. Um, once you are resigned to it, it it then becomes a case of rebuilding, doesn't it? And part of reforming our, rebuilding our lives, you could say, is not just the social element, but also uh, 
for want of a better word, the spiritual element. Um, I mean, I'm an atheist, but my atheism informs me in the direction of humanism and just appreciating, you know, life while we have it, <laughs> rather than worrying overly about um, about the afterlife or an afterlife as such. But yeah, definitely, there are ways of combating ostracism, and I, I'm really grateful that you've spelled out so meticulously um what it does to the human psyche when someone's being ostracized it's extremely helpful and also thank you for doing the work that you're doing because as as we've mentioned it's um perhaps an area of study that's overlooked to some degree so the fact that yourself and others are plugging away <laughs> at the religious side of things in particular is, is very heartening so thank you so much for the work that you're doing absolutely yeah so Andrew, again, thank you so much for joining me, viewers. I hope you found this interview interesting. I've certainly found it fascinating and it's given me a lot to ponder on. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And for now, thank you so much for watching.